100 progressive politicians ranging from councillors and MPs, including Jeremy Corbyn, have made a joint statement on the recent budget. Breaking independent Green implied Cymru MPs and nearly 100 progressive politicians come together for the first time to challenge Labour over a budget which punishes ordinary people. Attached is their full statement, so I'm going to read out a small part of it. Labour is raising defence expenditure to 2.5% of GDP while telling us there is no money to lift 250,000 children out of poverty, no money to help pensioners living in poverty stay warm this winter, and no money to maintain the £2 bus cap which punishes the poorest for trying to get to work and go about their lives. But simply, this is a lie. There is plenty of money. It's just in the wrong hands. The richest 1% in the UK hold more wealth than 70% of Britons. By refusing to impose a wealth tax, this government has chosen to force vulnerable communities to pay the price for years of economic failure instead of making the richest pay their fair share. Labour's first budget shows us whose side they're on. Then they've called on the Labour government to implement the following policies. Number one, abolish the two-child benefits cap and stop attacking welfare recipients. More than two-thirds of children in poverty live with a parent in work. We must support, not stigmatise welfare welfare recipients. Since the election, more than, more than 10,000 children have been pushed into poverty by the two-child limit. Abolishing the cap would cost 1.4 billion and lift 250,000 children out of poverty overnight. If this isn't a priority, what is? Number two, reverse cuts to winter fuel. Four in every five pensioners living below or just above the poverty line are set to lose the winter fuel payment. We will always defend the principle of universalism to ensure everyone has the support they need. Number three, restore the two pound bus cap. Scrapping the two pound bus fare cap outside of London harms the poorest in communities across England and discourages the use of public transport, transport when it is needed more than ever to tackle the climate crisis. Number four, invest in a Green New Deal. The climate emergency is the single greatest crisis of our time. Why then has the government reneged on its £28 billion climate pledge while continuing a Tory scheme to give £21.7 billion in public funds to subsidise the world's largest fossil fuel companies for carbon capture and storage when we know this doesn't work? We will continue to, to demand urgent investment in renewable energy and green jobs to safeguard our children's future. Number five, introduce wealth taxes. A 2% tax on wealth above £10 million would raise £24 billion every year. With that, you could abolish the two-child benefit cap 17 times over. There is plenty of money. It's just in the wrong hands. So there's some pretty uh, solid and robust policies there. Samuel, um, I just first want to ask, why have Labour continually ruled out a wealth tax? Might it be the fact that they have received millions of pounds of donations from private capital and investment firms? Well, I think that it may very well be the fact that they have received uh, millions in donations from billionaires and corporations. In fact, I read an article, I think just before the election, about how they had this, uh, Rachel Reeves had this strategy where she was courting uh, all these big businesses with their special packages and had this sort of business, like sort of, uh, you know, these like packages where you can get to speak to uh, Rachel yeah, Reeves. You know, I just thought to myself, you know, this is just cash for exchange. You know, this is, this is the more of the same uh, bullshit, if you will, that we were promised would be cleaned up. Um, but yeah, I think, I think this budget, like I, like I had mentioned earlier, there are some, I guess, some positives in, in terms of the fact that, so long we haven't had any re real terms increases in spending in, in certain departments especially for example education and there's been lots said about how there'll be some billions more there and stuff like that so then you know in terms of some real-term investments in those things yeah there are you know there are some positives but in general i think that it's absolutely nowhere near as ambitious enough as it needs to be when it comes to dealing with entrenched inequality in this country that is the real problem you know when it comes to our budget we always talk about growth right growth 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 and on one hand you could argue yeah okay you know you have a growing economy you have more jobs whatever but the other part of that equation is how the economy is set up you could have an economy that's growing but if all the growth is being captured by the top one percent then what's the point of that growth for the rest of the country? If everyone else is getting poorer, 
and the growth that people are contributing towards is not going directly toward back to them, then there's no point. So I think this budget had the opportunity to go further when it comes to addressing the issue of income and wealth inequality. Look, I, that's my thing, right? I don't, you know, Twitter is um, somewhere I try to stay off sometimes for, for quite long, as you know. <laughs> and I'm, sometimes... I'm, I'm still trying to do that. I um, <laughs> haven't successfully <laughs> removed myself off Twitter. Oh, so. it's, it's tough, you know, but I, and so, but when I, when I do come back on for the times I come up, what I always tweet about, you know, it's income and wealth inequality and, and the very stark statistics concerning how much wealth is concentrated in a particularly small group of people in this country. And, you know, when you talk about, for example, um, was it, was it um, jet, jet fuel tax, for example, there are, there are sprouts of doing the right thing. There's some, you can see small attempts of trying to go after the rich in, in, in a bit more substantial ways, but ultimately it doesn't go after them in, in the way that people like Jeremy Corbyn and, and Green, Green members have, have said, they, said it should. So I, I'm, I'm with agreement on them. And I think that, look, it's better than what the Tories would give. But at this point, it's just not going to cut it. I'm really glad you talked about growth. Now, growth is such a buzzword. I think for most people, do they really understand what it means? Because all you do here is growth, growth, growth. You hear it from the Tories. You hear it from the Labour Party. And you're absolutely right. There's no point talking about growth if all the growth goes to the top 1%. So what kind of growth do you want? And I think that, you know, the Liz Trust strategy was to grow the economy and that's going to improve public services, right? Even though the Labour Party attacks Liz Truss and her economic policy, their economic policy isn't, well, I mean, before the budget was pretty much the same. They said they're going to grow the economy and it's going to pay for public services. That's not going to happen unless you intervene, especially when you've privatised half of it. Um, yeah. Now, this budget itself, I mean, I agree with you. There are some good things in here. I do like that they're raising capital gains tax. I do like that they're taxing jet fuel. I do like that they're charging those that take private jets more money. They're good things, right? However, it shows that the, the Labour projects currently at the helm of the party are not interested in reducing inequality because they're only uh, increasing these small taxes. They're pretty small, I would say, in the grand scheme of things, to pay for certain things, but they're not to balance the economy so i would say what i want to see you know a, a lot higher taxes on the wealthy one because you know you could use it to pay for stuff but two because we need to you know have a far more equitable society i mean the the statement that the the progressive mps and, and councillors said is that uh, the top one percent earns more than 70 percent of the country it's it's astonishing um I would and, ask and you. Just very yeah, quickly, go yeah, go ahead. Look, yeah. Just to say, yeah, that the irony, of course, is that when people talk about growth, it's like an either or. But I mean, sure. from the perspective of hoarding wealth, I don't know how that grows the economy. You know, this is a conversation that's like very rarely had. If you have an economy where you have billionaires sitting on a huge amount of wealth, that wealth, as, as you know, you've probably heard this before, but obviously it's not getting moved around in the economy. It's sitting in one place. And the idea that you actually tax people. Uh, sorry, tax rich people, that money goes back into the system. Lower income people will use that money. It won't be, you can believe me in this economy, it won't be sitting in their account. <laughs> it will be going on necessities, it'll be going on food, it'll be going on paying bills, it'll be going on getting the economy moving. So, and I'm not some uh, economist or some kind of economy enthusiast, you know, where, where I'm like some capitalist, you know, I'm, I'm not. But it's just the idea that, you know, the capitalists themselves, when they talk about growth, they're not actually thinking about the longer term implications of growth, not just now, now, now. Yes, it is. It's a very short term strategy, even, you know, looking at extreme profits. That's a, that's a great strategy if you're a business owner. But then when you have very, very high levels of profits, where does that come from? It doesn't come out of thin air. Usually it comes from exploiting the worker or the consumer. But after a while... Those that pay your profits run out of money, which is why we have uh, the boom and bust cycles, why we have economic crises, precisely because of that. And I think yeah. this growth model is the same thing. It's all well saying, look at us, we're the fastest growing economy in the G7. You hear that all the time, 
But what about ordinary people and their purchasing power? Very, very low. In fact, because this budget does not address income inequality and wealth inequality, the targets the Labour Party uh, set themselves in terms of growth, analysis and reports have shown they're not going to hit their own targets because you can't really truly grow an economy if it's all going to the top. It's, uh, it's almost like a false economy in a way. Um, one thing that was really missing from the budget was a comprehensive green policy. There was nothing really drastic that was anywhere near the scale we need. So what are your thoughts on that? And are you surprised? I know they're not a radical government, but, but the lack of green policies is quite astonishing. Yeah, it, it, it is disappointing. And um, I know that you mentioned it in the response from the, the group um, remarks about the budget, but uh, the carbon capture uh, initiatives. Mm -hmm. I don't know, obviously, for people in, in the audience, I don't know how much people know about carbon capture, but what my, from my experience working at Greenpeace, it seemed as though the consensus is that this is not a tried and tested, effective model that can really deal with taking carbon out of the atmosphere in large enough amounts to really be to really be deemed something effective or scalable at this time so i think that the huge investments in that are misguided and wrong i think that it's a, it's a sticking plaster if you will what what economists and serious minds on this topic have told us we need is actually a huge amount of a green investment in renewables right so that will do two things it's twofold right you get to lower the cost of bills for people because at this point, renewables are cheaper than uh, renewables are cheaper than uh, fossil fuels and oil and gas. And the second thing you are able to do is you're able to obviously deal with this climate crisis. You, you've seen what's going on in Spain. We know that there's an issue with the climate at the moment. Burning more fossil fuels isn't the answer, right? We know that we need to stop. So the budget not dealing with that and addressing it in a substantial way is, is criminal at this point. And again, it's part of the criticism that is central to this Labour government, which is that they're not prepared to take the real difficult, and, not, and in many cases, not very difficult, actually, but just drastic measures in terms of raising capital to deal with these immediate threats. It's not happening. I mean, I suppose it's quite difficult if you're a party that takes money from <laughs> these companies and now want to go after them. Um, but it's funny when we frame difficult decisions, when they say it always means on the poorest. Um, now, I think uh, there, there's a lot of people who've said, uh, you know, you're, 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 you're being too aggressive on this budget. It's, uh, it's quite a good budget. You know, it's not radical, but it's a start. And I say this, well, Rachel Rees went on TV and she said, this is an excellent budget and these are things we had to do. Uh, and she said, we're not going to do this again. Essentially, what, what she's saying is, this is as good as we're going to get it. She thinks this is a very radical budget. Those in the Labour Party, those in Parliament think it's extremely radical, right? It's not not radical. I'd say it's probably a centre-right, moderate, conservative budget. But they think it's radical. That means this is as far as they're going to go. So any budget that happens after this are probably going to be even more watered down. So yeah, it's not anything that we're going to, nothing from Parliament that's going to address the real issues you've talked about. Now, there are 100 politicians that signed this as councillors, MPs. So do you think this is the beginning of a real progressive movement? I mean, in Parliament, we have five independent MPs, including Jeremy Corbyn, uh, four Green MPs. That's a block of nine. It outnumbers reform. But of course, it's a small number compared to the totality of Parliament. However, this statement consisted of 100 people. So do you find this encouraging? And do you think this could be a, a beginning of some sort of uh, grassroots movement that engages with the electoral system to take on Tories' Labour reform? Yeah, I think it's really encouraging. I think it's a really good first step. I think that for a long time, progressives have been sort of like, what's next? You know, after the whole momentum, Corbyn era, we need, I think, some kind of hope. Some hopium, some copium, hmm. I think I call it. And I think that the more we see progressive MPs working together, whether it's on responding to inadequate budgets like this, or whether it's dealing with what's happening in Gaza and Lebanon, um, we need a serious block of MPs. We may not have, obviously, as much as Labour. Labour have their majority at the moment, but we can, we can definitely do serious damage 
or cause serious disruption in Parliament with those with with a, with a number that big. So I think it's a good first step. Um, I think that <laughs> yeah, we, we do need that hopium. I'm just looking at some of the comments. We do need that hopium after the Corbyn era. I think it's a very serious discussion to have. I think a lot of leftists are very sad and very upset about the lack of political options and realities for us to engage with outside of just either hard right or uh, maybe a, a sort of a increasingly hard um, center hard right labor. I'm not sure what we should <laughs> Radical it. centrists. Uh... Ra- ra- radical <laughs> centrism or, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that that is interesting. But yeah, I think that hopefully, fingers crossed, in this next parliament, we have the new, especially the new Green MPs, find their foot, footing and be able to do more things um, to, yeah, to disrupt the government. Yeah, um, look, I, I'm going to be honest, uh, this year I've been quite pessimistic. There's not been much in politics has really given me hope. In terms of the US, it's a disaster. Here, yeah, it's a disaster. Um, but when I was researching the story, I'm not going to lie, I felt a little, little bit of hope. And the reason why is because it's coalition building. You've got parties from Plaid, Green, and Independence Plus, a bunch of councillors, um, which really encourages me that these people can come together because coalition building is what is needed to take on uh, the current establishment politics. So yeah, I do feel a little bit of hope that I'm glad you do too. And I hope people watching, you feel that too as well.